All right. We are getting down to the last two weeks of our class, and I am super excited about that. Um, this topic tonight is a bit of a heavy topic. It's easy to understand, but at the same time, very complex. So I'm a little nervous, but also a little, really excited to get into it with you guys. Um, let's just start out with a word of prayer. And then I would like to ask you um, what's something that you have that you were challenged by or encouraged by by last week's topic on sola gratia. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Father, I just thank you so much for this gift to come together to learn more about you. <sighs> Father, I pray that you would um, just use the scriptures that I shared tonight, use the um, theological points that I'm sharing tonight in a way that honors you, Lord. Um, I pray, Father, that women would walk out of this room more passionate about the gospel than they were when they entered. Lord, by your power and for your glory and because of your goodness. Father, um, I ask that if I say anything that does not align with your word, that everyone would just forget it the moment that they walk out, Lord. Um, hide me behind the cross, Lord, and I pray that um, the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine so brightly through this uh, message tonight. Lord, we love you. We humbly plead with you um, for your Holy Spirit to move in us and through us. And I ask this all in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, ladies. So what are some things that challenged your theology from last week? We got a lot to cover, so love to hear. Yes, ma'am. I loved the, the thought of when we were thinking about obedience, just to think how big God is and how much he has done for me. And so whatever he's asking me to do in the moment is really nothing compared to everything that he's done for me. Amen. That's a wonderful point. What else? Yes, Elena. It was really encouraging just to be reminded that you know, salvation is all of God. It has nothing to do with us choosing. You know, that He is the one who shows us. And we went over a few years <coughs> one, you know, how, you know, He predestined us before the foundations of the, of the earth, right? He chose us then to believe, you know, salvation wasn't a, a plan B. It was, you know, plan A. Plan A. Amen. It was His plan from the get go. Yes. Exactly. Amen. I think that, that I just like the challenge of remembering that the purpose of his grace is for his glory. Like, I think I often think of grace as a gift to me, and that's mm. kind of what grace is. But it's all to point back to his glory and to give him praise and honor. Mm. Yes, like mm -hmm. I, you just brought up Roman, or Ephesians 1, his, according to his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Everything in our lives as a believer always comes back to what's God's will for my life. It's always to point back to the praise of his glorious grace. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure you're getting sick of me covering this, <laughs> but we're going to go over it again because I want us always to just come back to the point of like, why are we doing this class? What's the point of taking this? What do I want you to walk away with? Okay, we're trying to equip women to pursue the study of biblical doctrines, to know God as far as he may be known, in order to love him deeper and to serve him more faithfully. And that is what we want to do tonight as we're studying uh, sola fide. Believers are saved by faith alone. So question, what does it mean to be self-righteous? Any thoughts? What do you think, Shelly? Someone who's prideful, that takes stock in themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, pride is definitely the root of that. Any other thoughts? What does it mean to be self-righteous? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Relying on yourself for your salvation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So last week we talked about sola gratia. We are saved by grace alone, and that flows directly into our topic tonight of sola fide. <clears throat> it's because of sola gratia that we arrive at sola fide. 
Like I said, it's very simple to understand, but it is literally this doctrine is the foundation of all of Christianity. A sinner is declared righteous by faith alone. So we are going to first walk through what's called the order, Ordu Salutis, the order of salvation. And I'm also going to write it on this board because we're going to come back to it. Okay, the first is election. God's choice of some into salvation. Another word for this is predestination. Basically, it means before the foundation of the earth, you were chosen. Before God ever created Adam and Eve, he, God already knew who you were, and he already had chosen you. If you are saved by grace, he had already chosen you to live for eternity with him. Regeneration. The new birth. Conversion. Okay, so... These are all things. Now we're starting to get into <clears throat> those. The first couple things are what we were gonna, what we're gonna call as the external call. Okay. Now we're gonna get into some of the theology of what happens at this moment. So think of like slow and then boom, 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 boom. Okay. So servant conversion, which is repentance and faith in Christ. Then we get to justification. That happens at the moment of salvation. It's the declaration of right legal standing. Then we are adopted. Being placed into the family of God. Sanctification. I apologize that this marker is not very dark. Okay. And um, tonight we're going to be talking a lot about progressive sanctification, but there's also this element of positional sanctification. I don't have time to go into the differences between the two, um, but um, tonight for the sake of um, a lot of what I, when I refer to sanctification, I'm going to be mainly referring to progressive sanctification which if you remember, um, um, the, process of pro the process of progressive sanctification is that from the moment of salvation, I, the Lord starts a new work in me. I am regenerated. I'm a new soul. I'm, I have new life. I am a new man. And through this, the Lord is growing me, sanctifying me, which means to cleanse, to purify, until I get to glory. Oh my goodness, this marker is failing more and more. Until I get to glory, which this process is preparing me for my real home, my real life in Christ. Okay, so I am slowly being sanctified to the point where I am glorified, which we will get to that in a second. Perseverance. This concept, okay, um, we're not going to talk a lot about Calvinism. I do bring up John Calvin quotes through my messages in this talk, but essentially this is a concept of Calvinism called perseverance of the saints. What this means is that when you get saved, you are justified. You are adopted. That doesn't change. doesn't matter how messed up you make your life out to be that doesn't change and this process of perseverance of the saints means that god will always bring you back doesn't matter i mean not to joke uh, quote johnny cash he's not exactly like a <laughs> robust theologian but that concept of god will always cut you down right if you are truly his child he will always bring you back so if you see someone who claims to be saved and we'll get to this a little bit later but you the Lord never brings them back into the faith. They didn't lose their salvation. It's hard to grapple with this, but they 
we're probably never saved in the first place, okay? So perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved. Okay, last, um, the true believers remain in Christ. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Last is glorification. Okay, receiving a resurrection body, and that happens when we get to heaven. Okay, so we're going to start out. I am going to be um, sharing a lot of different verses tonight, but I want us to come have like a home text, okay, that we're just going to go through to, I want to show you like this is a concept in scripture that you're going to see all over the place, but the biggest, most robust place in scripture where we can learn about the doctrine of, of justification is in Romans. So let's turn to Romans 3. We're just going to read it together. And I'm just going to read the whole chapter. Uh, Romans 3. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true through everyone, though everyone were a liar, as, as it is written, that you may justified, be justified in your words and then prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness show, serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some sl people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So this is saying, it doesn't matter how much religious training. This is true of you. It doesn't matter what family you were born in. None are righteous. It doesn't matter how boring of a testimony you've had. None are righteous. None are good. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So what this is saying is, it doesn't matter how many rules you obey, you will not be justified by your works. Okay, now we're getting to the, the real meat of this passage. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Hallelujah. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier as the one who has faith in Jesus. This is a very important point right here. This is saying you are not just enough to declare yourself, to make that decision on whether you should be counted as righteous or not. We are so wicked that there's no way we are capable of judging ourselves accurately. God is both the just, so the judge, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So then what becomes of our boasting? It is exclusive. But what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. This is where sola fide comes in. We are justified by faith alone. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 
Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of different verses, but I also just wanted to take a minute to just take have a home text of this is the biggest chunk of meat in the whole Bible that really breaks down justification. Honestly, really this class needed to be like a two-part class where we like walked through that passage and then the next week I talk about all that I'm going to talk about tonight. I don't have that luxury, so we're just going to read it and we're going to keep moving forward. Okay, <clears throat> so this section is called the definition of justification. So in justification, God provides the answer to mankind's most basic and theological, excuse me, most basic theological and religious question. How can sinners come to be in a right relationship with the holy God of the universe? So question, what is holiness? Yep, it means that God is set apart. So why does God's holiness require redemption of sins? If God is love, why didn't he just say, oh, y'all, just come, just come, have a party with me in heaven forever? Because sin can't be in his presence. Yep. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say he's also a just God, so if he doesn't follow um, his character, he's not. He's not, he's not going to be true to his character if he just says, the only can come from heaven. Absolutely. Yeah. That is awesome. Any other thoughts? So since God is holy, it means he is perfect. He is righteous. Like we said, he cannot be in the presence of sin. So God requires a perfect righteousness in order to bring someone into his presence. So let's talk about God's character first. Like I just said, God is perfectly righteous. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 48 says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. By the way, this verse totally destroys every argument of someone that says, Oh, I'm a perfectionist. It's like, well, good. That's a good thing because God calls you to be a perfectionist. Right? Shots fired. Right? right? Exactly. <laughs> if you struggle with perfectionism, you need to break that down a little bit more because Jesus actually does call you to be a perfectionist. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> <laughs> the concept of that, though, is that you don't have to earn your way. We're not perfect. We don't strive for perfection because that's what earns God's love. Right? We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it always, yeah, it always makes me laugh when someone says, oh, I struggle with perfectionism. I'm like, I, that's not your struggle, sweetie. <laughs> okay, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is entirely holy, free from any moral defect or impurity. <coughs> First John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. All mankind has sinned against God and thus falls short of that holy standard. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have broken his law and have thus incurred the penalty for their crimes, which is death and condemnation. So we see that in Romans 5.16 And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. So what's, what is that talking about right here? What's the one man's sin? Adam. Adam. Which is really interesting. Like, Adam didn't sin first. Mm -hmm. But like, throughout all of the rest of the Bible, that's who the pressure gets put on. <clears throat> another topic for another time. Okay. The free gift is not like the result of Adam's sin, for the judgment following Adam's trespasses brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So what this is basically saying is that there is a new Adam who, instead of listening to the serpent, crushed him on the head. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. 
but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So a definition for justification is that justification is that aspect of the application of redemption. So that's like that, that uh, phrase, application of redemption. As I have shared with you guys, um, I am, Tirza and I are studying from a theological book by John MacArthur. And in his Doctrine of Salvation, he talks about redemption and then the application of redemption. And so some of these things, <clears throat> excuse me, are, these are what would be considered the applications of redemption, the applications of being saved. So justification is that aspect of the application of redemption in which God legally declares the sinner to be righteous in his sight. Salvation is a matter of righteousness. If you want to sum up salvation in one word, this is the word. Salvation requires righteousness. I uh, got that from John MacArthur, so can't take credit for that. Salvation and God's righteousness is <clears throat> imputed to the believer. So man's answer is always going to be to try to order his life by some moral or ritualistic standard. If we can do this, then that means that we can add something to our salvation and thus achieve righteousness acceptable to God. But the Bible consistently denies that anyone can be justified by works. Rather, salvation and God's righteousness is imputed. We're going to talk more about that word. Okay, imputed means to count towards something. We'll break it down a little bit. But it's imputed to the believer by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So question, I would love to hear, what have you learned so far in this series that would explain what it means to be saved by grace alone and in Christ alone? So like, how would you describe that to someone who's like, sola gratia? What does that mean? Solus Christus. It's all Jesus and none of me. Mm hmm Yep. On the basis of what merit am I receiving these gifts? It's not by works, it's by grace, right? I'm not the one who's getting the glory. It's all because of Christ. It's in Christ and through Christ and because of Christ. So Romans, <clears throat> I talked a little bit, we read through Romans um, 3, let me open back up to it. Um, well, I'm just going to, for sake of time. Um, <clears throat> this, if you want to continue studying this concept of justification, Romans 3 verses 21 through 28, that's going to be the real meat of, if you want to keep doing a deep dive on this, this is the passage that you're going to want to go through. Okay, there have been, since the beginning of time, only two religions. Okay, do you remember that first week when we talked about, um, I had someone explain to me once that all religions, it's like a wheel, and all religions are like a spoke in the wheel, and they all point to one God. It's like, no. That, or that concept of like all, there's many paths, but they all lead to the same God. Like, that's not possible, right? Because Jesus says, I am the way. So there, because of Jesus being exclusive, there are really, you can sum it down to there are only two religions. One is the religion of human achievement, by which man works to his own righteousness. Second religion religion is the religion of divine accomplishment whereby God accomplishes righteousness by the holy life and substitutionary death of the son of God and then freely gives that righteousness as a gift through faith alone so essentially what this is saying is that every other religion apart from Christianity says if you the things that you deeply crave in your soul joy peace contentment if you want those things, 
here's how you get here. Deny yourself in this way. Do this way. Pen, do penance or all these different things, okay? Here's how you can work and deny yourself or pay this or do that, okay, to get where you want to be, to feel the way you want to be, okay? And then in Christianity, Christ is like, done. It is finished. You can't add anything more to what I've already done. And if you think you can, then you're full of pride, okay? Christ says, it is finished. Okay, the nature of justification, it is a legal declaration. Justification is a legal declaration of righteousness. It is not an actual infusion of righteousness. Okay, so let me say that again. It's a legal declaration of righteousness. It's not an infusion of righteousness into your soul. It describes what God declares about the believer, not what he does to change the believer. In fact, justification by itself has no actual change whatsoever in the sinner's nature or character. So I'm going to give two examples to kind of flesh that out. Okay, so again, what we're saying is that we need to differentiate between this concept and this concept. Okay. Okay. First example would be a wedding. Okay. When a pastor says, by the power vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. There is an instant change in the legal status of those two people, the couple standing in front of him. And it has life-changing implications, but it does nothing to change the characters of the bride and groom. One minute, they are two single people in pretty clothes, and a few minutes later, they are husband and wife in pretty clothes. Okay, another example of this is a courtroom. Okay, when someone is accused of a crime and a jury gives their verdict as not guilty, it is basically the declaration that in the eyes of the law, that person is not considered guilty of that crime. But the jury's verdict does not make the man not guilty, okay? His own actions are on the basis of his guilt or innocence. So, if, fleshing that example out a little bit, if if someone is declared not guilty in a courtroom of a crime, does that mean that his life is free of evil? No. No. So justification spoken of in scripture is God's divine verdict of not guilty, fully righteous, pronounced on the sinner. In the case of justification, it is not that we are actually innocent, but that another has paid the full penalty of our crimes. Martin Luther once said that justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. For it concerns the only way that the sinful man can be declared righteous in God's sight. So what Martin Luther is saying is that this doctrine is the foundation of Christianity. Justification, we have to understand that it is different than sanctification. And honestly, this is is where we differ from the Roman Catholic Church. So they believe that justification is transformative which means instead of to declare righteous to make righteous and to my understanding i'm not a scholar on this topic but to my understanding the way they got there is that we are basing it on the original greek text and they are basing it upon a latin text which does mean to make righteous but that is not an accurate translation So what they believe is that at the moment of conversion, someone is fully sanctified. But what's the problem with that? Does anyone see a problem with that? What do you do with that? Yes. It's a breeding ground for exhausting 
and life-sucking legalism. Legalism. So justification, it does go hand in hand with sanctification, but they are different doctrines. And um, during the section, the results of justification, I'll kind of explain more how they're connected, um, why they go hand in hand. But um, failing to understand that justification is a legal declaration instead of using it as a transformative process, if we mix this up, it destroys the very foundation of the gospel. The grounds of justification, imputed righteousness. So imputation is a fancy word that means to transfer one person's account to another. Okay, it means to transfer one person's account to another. So what happens at salvation is a twofold act. Two things. God, one, imputes my sin to Christ, takes my sinful account and puts it on Christ and punishes him in my place. And at the same time, God imputes Christ's righteousness to me and grants me eternal life in him. So we're going to break down those two imputations. And I want to show you the scriptures behind how we can get there theologically. Okay, so the first thing is that the imputation of our sin to Christ, the forgiveness of sins. The best passage that talks about this is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what does that mean that the Father made the Son sin on our behalf? What does that mean? <coughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, since he's God, like he is the only one that can be the perfect <clears throat> sacrifice. And so then he, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're getting it. So even bringing up the Old Testament, <clears throat> if you think about um, after Adam and Eve sinned, um, the first animal sacrifice was to clothe them, right? Um, at that time in the garden, everyone was, what's that called, herbivores? Like, is that what it's called? They're all plant eaters, right? There was no killing. So did that animal do anything wrong? No. Like, that's, rep that's a small representation of what we're talking about here. It would be blasphem blasphemous for us to suggest that God actually made Jesus to be a sinner, because God cannot sin. Jesus was holy. Instead, the Father judicially declared Christ to have committed the sins of those for whom he was giving himself as a substitute. Just like our legal declaration of not guilty doesn't actually mean that we are sinless, so Jesus' declaration of guilty does not mean that he actually sinned. Just treated him. Like yep. That. It's what, it's the lens. Mm -hmm. What the legal declaration of what God's um, accounting us for. Okay. Um, I skipped ahead a little bit, sorry. Okay. Although there are innumerable sinners who will escape punishment for their sins because of Christ on the cross, no sin will ever go unpunished. So if you've been saved by grace, Jesus was punished for every single sin. If you are an unbeliever, you will be punished, another word for that is tortured, for every sin in hell for eternity. So no foolish, unrighteous act in your life will ever go unpunished. That's something that we have to consider very, very soberly. Either we will bear the punishment or Christ will. Because God is just, just like what Mega was saying. He cannot sweep it under the rug. The sins that you may think are not a big deal, God doesn't wink at that. He had his son murdered 
for that sin. All sins will be punished. It is either punished at the cross or we will bear the punishment if we haven't been saved. And that is why we can arrive at, at passages like Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is referring to justification. Romans 4, 7 through 8 is another wonderful passage. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count. So this is that imputation process. The Lord will not count his sin. It doesn't mean that God doesn't see it. It means that the, uh, the legal transaction, there is an, an innocent party who is covering that. <clears throat> so because of Christ, a believer's sins are not counted against us. They are forgiven and covered by the blood of Christ. Therefore, this is why believers, one, we face, because of justification, we face no condemnation, which I cannot tell you how many times this verse has been a comfort to my soul. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can also see that later in uh, Romans 8 and verses 33 through 34. What this means is that if you have sin in your life that you are embarrassed about, the devil wants you to try to cover it up and pretend it didn't happen. But God says, no, no, no. If you have been saved, there is no condemnation, which means there is no shame. Christ died a shameful death at the cross so that you can live shame free. So what glorifies God the most is with the sins that we're most embarrassed about, that we're most that we feel the most guilt about, take it right to him. Because he says, you are free, daughter. Bring them to me. Let me heal you. Let me cleanse you in that area of your life. Let me cover you with my forgiveness. Believers who have been justified by Christ, we enjoy peace with God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1. And believers also, we get to enjoy the sure hope of eternal life. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3, 7. And again, you can also look at uh, Romans 8, 30 for proof of that. So we talked about <clears throat> one aspect is the imputation of our sin onto Christ. And now we'll discuss the other transaction that happened, the justification, which, which is um, Christ's imputation, Christ's righteousness imputed on us. This is the provision of righteousness. So some people describe justification as justification just as if I never sinned. Okay, but that is not true. That's kind of like a Sunday school answer that really doesn't hold a lot of theological weight um, because that suggests, again, that God is sweeping our sins under the rug and instead just looking at us adoringly. Okay, salvation is not a matter of sinlessness or innocence, but it is a matter of righteousness. Okay, so again, um, we're seeing this concept of like God demands us, demands perfection from us. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So this was the original, excuse me, religious elite. So unless your righteousness, your ability to understand God's law and obey God's law far exceeds the religious scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. There is a standard that the more you understand the standard, the more you should see I fall short all the time. So not only does God require us to be sinless, he requires us to be perfect, righteous, and holy. So because we do not live lives of perfect righteousness, we don't walk out our obedience to God in all things, we don't love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we don't love our neighbors as ourselves, that means if we are to be saved, our substitute must not only pay our penalty by absorbing the wrath of God against our sin, but 
must also obey all the positive demands of the law that were required of us. Romans 4, 4 and 5 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as unrighteous. So, okay, I know we're throwing out like a lot of um, theological terms here, but what are some ways, as we're talking about this doctrine of, salvi- uh, of justification, what are some ways that you can fight sin and temptation with the doctrine of justification? Mm-hmm. So say when you're in a, a situation where you're choosing to sin or not, you can say scripture and that will help um, protect you from the, from the enemy as well as um, put your eyes on the Lord. Yes, excellent. What else? How does the doctrine of justification Help, how can it help you fight sin? Yes, ma'am. You can repent, you know, and, and just have the spirit of repentance. You know, I mean, we all sin, and it's, we need to have a short account. It's quick to repent. Yeah, excellent. Any other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. You might consider that God has your son murdered or had sin. Yes, excellent. I was thinking twofold. There's that <clears throat> side of it that the, the sin that I'm committing has, the price has been paid. Mm-hmm. And the, the flip side of that is the price has been paid. Mm-hmm. I don't have to live in condemnation mm-hmm. or shame because, because it has been paid. So there's the, the dichotomy of the gravity of my sin, but yet the gravity of my sin has already been paid. And I can live in freedom. Mm, excellent. Excellent. So I appreciate that you brought up um, scripture. Um, during a really hard season in my life, I really cling to uh, Psalm 34, which over and over it says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears him and delivers him. Right? That's a really beautiful psalm for someone who's suffering. Um, and as I was reading that, over, I mean, literally multiple times a day, over and over and over again. I realized, like, when it says the righteous cry out, it doesn't matter if I've had a horrible week. It's Christ's righteousness. That's what that's talking about. There are many promises in Scripture that talk about, especially throughout the Psalms, that talk about beautiful passages for the righteous. So if you've had a week where you're like, man, I don't even want to tell people I'm a Christian. I'm so messed up. I've just jacked it up, okay? We don't approach the promises of God with looking back on, how has my week been? Do I deserve that? Absolutely not. The answer is always going to be no. If you come to that question and think, yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been all right. Like, you got, you got to repent more than you even realize. But when you realize I'm covered by Christ's righteousness, that means all of the promises in Scripture come alive to me. It doesn't matter how I've acted this week. What matters is what I'm going to do about it. Okay? That should cause me to run to God's arms as quickly as possible with a heart that wants to worship him. I will tell you, for me personally, that concept on Sunday mornings, okay, when I come to worship, there are some weeks where I'm like, especially just getting kids ready for church by myself and just I already struggle with impatience. There are times where I, come, where I am driving to church and I'm thinking, oh, I don't even deserve to go into worship, which is totally prideful because it shows like how I'm thinking on the opposite weeks where I'm not having whatever, some issues, <laughs> if we're being honest. But I can come to worship and know that I'm allowed to worship God freely because God's looking at me through the lens of Christ's righteousness. So what that means is when I'm convicted of sin on my way to church, 
I make it right with God, I make it right with my kids, or whatever needs to happen. And then God's like, come daughter, come worship me. Let me fill you up with myself. Another way that I, honestly, the doctrine of justification is really important to me as I fight sin. Something that I will commonly ask myself is, Alexandra, what are you finding your justification in right now? Um, just a, a really silly example that um, is a bigger deal to me than it should be is my house, like a clean house. Um, to me, like I frequently am tempted to find justification, like God's approval through how picked up my house is. I know that sounds so silly, but literally that's how I counsel myself is, Alexander, you are finding your justification and wanting to have a tidy house right now. You foolish girl, <laughs> repent. Okay, I also, um, and like uh, I have mentioned, I came to Vision of Hope uh, for an eating disorder, and that is commonly one way that when I graduated from VOH, one way that I commonly counseled myself is, am I trying to find my justification in a perfect body or how I control my diet? There, are, I think there are lots of ways that we are um, tempted to be works-based. Okay, so that's really what I'm talking about is what do I think I need to do to earn God's love and his approval in my life? Okay, so that means if you're having a, a week where you're like, man, I really wasn't in God's word a lot this week, kind of messed up in that, God probably is not feeling super tight with me. No, 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 no. That's, that's not justification, okay? That's not justification. Yes, if you have messed up and you need to ask his forgiveness, do that. But God, once you have been converted and you have received new life, God's justification is 100% of the time, 100% full. Okay. Um, I, if you would like to talk about that more with me, please email me because I this that concept is really important to me in my life um and i think if you are tempted with any form of legalism this um this doctrine of justification is super helpful to study and um to help with fighting with temptation okay the means of justification is through faith alone this is sola fide so <clears throat> Sola fide permeates all of Jesus' gospel preaching. And so just to give an example, Jesus frequently said, your faith has made you well. It literally, I mean, I put all these different references. He literally says that exact phrase over and over again. Your faith has made you well. He doesn't say, hey, you were really great this week. And that has made you well. <clears throat> oh, I saw some people writing those down. I'll let you. Sorry. <laughs> You can email me if you uh, need more references. Faith in Christ is not the ground, is not the grounds of the believer's righteousness, but it is the instrument through which we receive Christ's righteousness. And a great example of this is the thief on the cross. Okay, Luke 23, starting with verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, being Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do, not, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So he's declaring God's righteousness right here. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, once you are baptized and you have gone through theology gals and you have served at church for five years, then you will be with me in paradise. No, he said, what day? What does he say? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. This man was not confirmed. This man had nothing. He had nothing to bring to the table. We are this criminal. Okay? You were either one of these criminals, and if you've been saved, then you're the, the thief on whatever side, the other side. Okay, 
He says, today you will be with me in paradise. No works were required for that thief to secure his salvation. He was not baptized. He never took the Lord's Supper. He never paid, paid tithes. He never served at church. He had no rich theology. He had nothing to bring to Jesus but faith that Jesus Christ was Lord. Let's turn to Luke 18. Starting in verse 9. Okay, I'm going to read Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So right now we're seeing, hey, what is self-righteousness? Literally, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They, were, they thought they were just enough to make that decision, and they themselves thought that they were the justifiers. Okay, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, so again, this is someone who has prettied themselves up with, they're literally the religious elite, okay? So they have done all of the right things. And this Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And what is he saying is the true act of humility here. It's where you find your justification for your sins. This concept, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you really get the doctrine of justification, this will be your heart. So on the flip side, if this is not where you're at today, you need to do a little more digging and see where you're at on this doctrine. Okay, you need to ask yourself, do I really think that Christ is the one who justifies me or do I think it's me plus Jesus? that's earning God's favor in my life. Jesus, his listeners, it says at the beginning in verse 9, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and this is the very definition of self-righteousness. Um, and honestly, this pas passage, um, it should demolish our critical hearts, and it should cause us to grow in deep, deep thankfulness. Um, we just went through the series about criticism, and now we're going through a series on thankfulness. And I just think this concept is really groundbreaking. If you struggle with a critical heart towards other believers in the church, this should be our attitude first and foremost. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <clears throat> okay, the results of justification, it should always end in good works. John Calvin once said, it is therefore faith alone which justifies, yet the faith which justifies is not alone. So I'll say that again. Faith alone justifies. So it's only Christ's righteousness that justifies us. Yet this faith which justifies is not alone. Which, which What that means is that you cannot just isolate this one doctrine in your life and stay there, okay? It has, this is salvation. The word gospel, it is a trendy word right now in reformed Christian culture, but not everything that uses the word gospel is truly biblical or even gospel focused. There is a sect of people in evangelical culture right now that claims that true gospel preaching is preaching that focuses exclusively on the doctrine of justification. So what that means is that 
they're saying that every sermon needs to only be, that the main point of every sermon, the main point of every text is justification. <clears throat> this style became a fad of preaching. I think it, um, I think it was, we, there, were, there was some preaching that was in this camp of moralism, and I think it was swinging. It, I think it's just swinging too far to another extreme. But um, the style of preaching became a fad within the last 10 years due to a certain evangelical pastor's growing popularity, which I res- this guy is actually, he's really great. Um, and his preaching is really sound. But the majority of his sermons usually come back to the doctrine of justification as being the main point of his passages. And it's not heretical. I actually agree with the hermeneutic of that. But it's his style of preaching for his church. What's concerning is that there's a growing sect of evangelicals in Christian culture who are saying that this style of preaching, that every sermon has to only be about justification, um, is the only way to preach a sermon. So what this means is that the biggest point of every sermon has to focus on how much God loves you. So do you see any issues with this? Yes. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm really nervous to talk about this right now. Why? Well, (laughs) the result is that if you believe that the only point of every sermon is supposed to only be about justification, is that when you start talking about sanctification, ways that believers need to grow and change, it is considered moralism. I have had people stand in front of me and my husband and say, when you preach, Holy Spirit leaves the room. Your preaching, I'm going to quote, is cyanide because of this. So yeah, I get a little passionate about this topic. If you, if we get stuck on a certain style of preaching, particularly this one, that says we can only preach about justification. Don't tell people what to do. Okay, the problem is that you can't preach through the entire Bible. Okay, let's take the book of Ephesians, for example. You have got six, book, six chapters in the book of Ephesians. If you're a legalist or a moralist, your temptation may just be to read chapters four through six. Hey, give me rules. I'll follow rules, right? I, honestly, like, that's where I'm tempted. I'm like, just show me the rules, God. I'll, I'll figure out how to obey the rules better, okay? That's just my heart, okay? Justif- justification has to be the base of all that we do. That's why... Ephesians 1 through 3 starts with Ephesians 1 through 3. It's the gospel indicatives. It talks about who you are in Christ. It comes before Ephesians 4 through 6, which talks about the gospel imperatives. Even looking at the Ten Commandments, God gave his covenant to the Israelites right before giving giving them those commandments. Relationship has to precede commands. But if you stay there and you don't ever talk about the effects of justification, then you may have the richest theology about what happened at the moment of salvation, but you may have a tongue that is an instrument of hell or a heart that is deeply bitter and defiling many. We have to preach to ourselves, ladies, okay? We have to preach to ourselves the entirety of Scripture. Justification and good works are always linked together in scripture. Do not be the type of woman that says, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. Do not worship a celebrity preacher and hold their style of preaching as your standard. Worship Jesus Christ. Truth needs to be your standard. Do not be a woman that judges everything off of what is currently trending in Christian culture. Be a woman of the word. True gospel-focused preaching puts Christ's righteousness as the base of all that we are and still challenges the sheep to follow the shepherd in holiness. And teaching others how to obey King Jesus is love. It is not moralism. Faith, so I'm going to use air quotes here, the faith of professing Christians who fail to make progress in practical holiness Continuing to walk in patterns of unrighteousness is no true and saving faith at all. The Bible has some pretty strong language about this. 
The Bible calls it dead faith. James 2, 17 and 26 says, so also faith by itself, it does not, if it does not have works, it is dead. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. It's called the demonic faith. You believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. The Bible says it's useless faith. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? So this faith marks them out as those who address Jesus as Lord, but whom he will not address as his children, which I think this is the most chilling passage in all of scripture. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I appreciate so much, as I was reading through Tears' notes from last week, that she covered this. <clears throat> so often, we want to just stop with, Roman, with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We don't want to go to verse 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works, so that no one would be both. So we're talking about justification. For we are his workmanship. For, this means, what are you saved for? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared before him, before then, that we should walk in them. So faith, again, it's not a result of works, of our works, but salvation does, it does result in good works. And this is the very purpose of our salvation. Those who deny that good works are the necessary fruit of justification received through faith alone, make out that the Lord Jesus Christ to be half a savior, one who saves from sin's pen penalty, but not his power. We are united with Christ, not only in his death, but also in his resurrection, which again, it's the necessarily result of a holy life. For the love of Christ controls us, Romans 6, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Therefore, while it is faith alone that saves, the faith that saves is never alone. It should always be accompanied by the fruit of righteousness. And it is wrought by the Holy Spirit of the life in the believer. Okay. Yep, sorry. Okay. So, <clears throat> it will always be accompanied by the fruit of righteousness. Philippians 1.11. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. John 15.8 says, but this, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So, in conclusion, the righteousness of Christ is applied to believers at the moment of salvation by Christ. By one, he died to provide the forgiveness of sins. And two, Christ walked in perfect obedience to his Father in order to provide the righteousness required to, for fellowship with God. So, by grace alone, God imputes our sin to Christ for him to bear our punishment and he imputes Christ's righteousness to us so that we might stand before him in perfect holiness. And again, this does not mean that when you've been justified that you are actually innocent. Okay, that's this process of sanctification. When you are glorified, then you will have received a resurrected body. You will be fully sanctified at that time. At the moment of justification, you are not fully glorified yet. The impu imputation process is through faith alone. It is not by works. But the works are the evidence that true and saving faith has happened in a believer's heart. This doctrine goes straight to the heart of the gospel, and it is the foundation of John 3.16 and Romans 8.1. We are not justified by our works, but a work that has already been accomplished. Does anyone have any questions.
think I was a little nervous to talk about some of that, so I was like, flow, flow through that quickly. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was so rich. Does anyone have any questions about the stuff that we talked about tonight? What was that reference in Titus again? Um, Titus 3, 3, 7. Okay, I'll take their word for it. 3, 7. Yes. I have a different set of notes. Um, which number? Yeah, which number? Is it on the back page? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just yes. really glad that you uh, called out that, you know, it, it's just so popular and it has been for 20 years about justification just as if I did it. Mm-hmm. And it's wrong. It is. That is so wrong. So I'm glad that you pointed that out because most most people don't. And I, I, you know, I still hear people around here saying that all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just it's not correct at all. It cheapens the gospel. It does cheapen mm-hmm. the gospel. That's mm-hmm. a good way to put it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so some um, announcements. So. Last week of homework, if you've been doing your homework, um, I'll email this out tomorrow, but our next memory verse is going to be Hebrews 4.12. Um, next week is the last week of class. I can't even. I know, I can't <laughs> even either. Sola Scripture us. Believers are saved according to Scripture alone. Of course, Tirza will be teaching that, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her talk. Another announcement. Theology Gals 2 starts February 22nd. I can't believe I'm already announcing that. The focus on this next series is going to be on the Trinity. 